Welcome back to A View from Mulberry Street with Matthew J. Mary. Welcome back to the Matt Cave. Here we are again. And uh, today, we're very lucky. Not only will I be, uh, you know, talking and telling you, you know, my view on things, but we've got one of the world-class experts on organized crime, probably probably the most uh, recognized expert on organized crime in the United States. Jerry Capisi is the author of the column, the internet column, known as ganglandnews.com. And uh, he's been doing that for decades. It's the Bible, the Bible of the underworld. Every defendant in a criminal case reads his column. All the criminal defense lawyers, they read his column. All the FBI agents read his column. The prosecutors read his column, and so do the judges. And I can say that on a few occasions, some of the things he has said has influenced uh, the criminal justice system. And from my point of view, on those occasions, in a very good way. So welcome, Jerry Capisi. How are you? I'm pretty good, Matty. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, I don't know if I'm uh, an expert, but uh, I do the best I can at uh, trying to uh, write stories about uh, so-called organized crime, as uh, as you put it. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, Jerry, I think in, in the interest of full disclosure, I should reveal that I am a graduate of Xavier High School, a Jesuit school, a military school, as are you, and yeah. as, as is my producer, Neil Healy, who's out in California right now. So we do have something in common. Jerry, you know, you started out so long ago uh, as a journalist. How did you find your way into being a crime reporter? It kind of just happened. Um, I got my first assignment uh, for the New York Post uh, covering police headquarters in, in Brooklyn. I mean, there used to be a police headquarters in each borough in the city at that time. And I covered police headquarters in Brooklyn and began covering the courts in uh, Brooklyn, the federal and state courts in Brooklyn. And it kind of just developed that there were a lot of stories about gangsters, organized crime that uh, I, I managed to to uh, cover on assignment from the New York editors at the New York Post. It kind of just developed from there. Um, I did I did cover uh, Paul Castellano's first trial um, when I was working for the Post in 76 or 77. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, when I got to the Daily News, I started covering uh, John Gotti's uh, cases in the Eastern District of New York. Now, I... Uh after a while, and you did every kind of, of crime story when you worked for the New York Post and the New York Daily News, but th there came a point in time when you, you kind of started to focus on organized crime cases, and you did your column, I believe it was in the Post or the News, when you first started with Gangland? Yeah, that started in the news in uh, 19, uh, about 1989, that started in the Daily News, uh, Maddie, and I did it in the news for about five or six years. And then in 1996, um, I put the column online, and it's been there ever since. Uh, it kind of like just developed uh, as the way to go. And as it turned out, it was a good uh, it was a good move for me to uh, to go um, to get it online. Now that uh, newspapers are kind of like dying out, it's uh, it is the place to be, so to speak. Well, actually, you one of the, the one of the pioneers of news on the internet. And, uh, you know, the Gangland News column <laughs> was the first thing that I ever got on my computer, on the Internet. I mean, and I tried and I tried and I tried and I, and I still have, I'm still technically challenged today, but I tried my best. And, and you were the only thing that I succeeded in getting on the Internet. And, uh, you know, I've been reading that every week and it turned out amazingly uh, as you say it seems like the newspapers uh, will soon be a thing of the past and, and everyone's getting their news on the internet and there you are you know the uh, the pioneer of it all because i did a guest column for you uh a few months ago and and boy it, it wasn't easy 
to to you know to do three stories and and to, to you know get your story together and then to go over the story and fact check the story and you know change it up and down in and out but do you need a lot of technical help to 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 put out ganglandnews.com every week I needed I needed a lot of technical help and occasionally I still do to get the the website uh, uh, you know uh, working and, and set up, but pretty it's pretty much by rote. You know, I'm uh, I'm not an expert in uh, internet stuff uh, at all. I do things kind of like by rote, but I do check out the uh, the facts uh, just the way I used to uh, check them out when I uh, started working as a newspaper reporter back in the back in the seventies. It's uh, it's pretty much you know I, the way I decide the way I cover organized crime is pretty much the way. Any reporter covers any beat. You ask as many different people um, who are involved in the story and know a little bit about the story for their perspective on it and try to get a, a full idea of what really is going on and then put it out into, a, you know, a readable story for the, for the people out there, you know, who are interested in finding out about it. Now, you know, I'm, I'm an avid fan of yours and, and from time to time, you know, you've always given me the opportunity to say what I have to say about a case I'm working on. But, you know, a lot of people fail. They fail to understand that you are a reporter. You're a reporter. And that, that means basically you are reporting what goes on in the courts and around the town concerning organized crime. And, and you know, it, it's kind of strange that, that some people may think that, that a lot of your stories come from law enforcement, and they do, and, and many people conclude that you're like a public relations man for, for the government. Now, I know you always, always give defense lawyers a chance to present their point of view and the facts that might be favorable to their case. Uh, do you consider your your column to be fair and impartial? And how do you react when, when people think you're on like one side or another? Of course I do, Maddie. And you know, you, 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 you said it, I, I definitely will try to get the side of the gangster, so to speak, or the organized crime guy, the wise guy from uh, his attorney or, uh, you know, at, at every, at every step along the way. Uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, some days um, on Thursdays, uh, I'll get uh, annoying emails saying that I'm a shill for the government. Uh, some Thursdays, I'll get annoying emails saying that I'm a shill for the gangsters or the wise guys. It depends on whose ox is being gored at that particular moment. Uh, each, uh, you know, each story I do, I try to do as fairly and as accurately as I can based on the information I can get. A lot of times, defense lawyers won't talk. A lot of times, organized crime, you know, uh, detectives and cops and uh, Prosecutors won't talk either, and then I have to try and do the best I can based on court uh, court records and uh, dealing with uh, other conversations with people, you know, who I'm not quoting. But uh, the bottom line is, I do my best to get it, you know, to get it as accurate as I can. Uh, it's been uh, it's been a very interesting uh, few decades uh, covering organized crime. That's for sure. Things have changed quite a bit from the days of uh, uh, John Gotti and all the murders that were going on in the '80s and '90s in Brooklyn and Queens. That's for sure. I know that I've been a tr an attorney for 45 years, and you know I, I do all kinds of cases, but I guess I'm well known for being involved in organized crime cases, and uh, I've seen a dramatic drop-off in, in the number of cases uh, that are coming before the courts, a lot of recycled business, a lot of recycled defendants, a lot of weak cases. I mean, really weak cases. Back in the old days, in the 80s, I mean, we were talking about blood and guts in the courtroom, all right? And now we're talking about mostly nonsense. I, I hate to describe it that way, but I think that the government, in reference to organized crime cases, are kind of getting a little desperate, and, and I know there are fewer and fewer and fewer cases for me, and I imagine it's, it's, it's getting hard for you to keep the column up the way you used to do it. Well, there's no question that one of the big changes, Maddie, is we've, we've said it uh, a little bit already, is that uh, in 2022, there are a lot 
less murders, there's a lot less violence connected with organized crime. That's why you have, you know, so many fewer cases than, uh, than there were back in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, it's one of the reasons why the uh, clout, uh, if you will, or the influence of organized crime has dissipated, so to speak. Uh, you know, fear is the main factor that uh, gets people to do what you want them to do. Uh, and there is less fear these days that uh, the mob is going to be killing people the way they used to. Um, the last um, organized crime hit, the uh, sanctioned uh, murder that uh, took place in New York City was what, in 2012, 2013, uh, Michael Meldish. I mean, and before that, I can't even remember the one before that, before that. So there's a lot less violence going on today. The mob doesn't kill people the way they used to. There's no question about that. Uh, and one of the reasons they don't is because they realize that uh, murder is one of those crimes that you go away for a lifetime for. And rather than go away, you know, spend the rest of your life in prison, wise guys are smart enough to realize you know, maybe uh, I don't have to kill somebody. I'll be able to uh, enjoy myself uh, as a free man a lot longer. And, and you know, Jerry, during, during the last decade, even the, the numerous murder cases I've been involved in in federal court, the murders themselves took place 20 years before that. So they're prosecuting guys, you know, in the year 2005 for murders that took place in like 1985. And like, I call them ancient murders. There's a whole, whole catalog of, of these federal cases that involve ancient murders where the government goes forward with something that occurred in the last five years, let's say Joker poker machines. And then they got some informant who's going to talk about a murder from 25 years before. And it's so difficult, I can tell you as a lawyer, it's so difficult to fight a case when the murder in question happened so, so long ago. And, uh, you know, but back in the day, in the 80s, you know, you wrote a book uh, uh, with a co-author, I forget uh, who it was, but Murder Machine. And that was about a prolific, prolific uh, group of people that, uh, according to the government, uh, in the book you wrote, were just constantly, constantly uh, doing stuff like that. I mean, tell us a little bit about Murder Machine. Well, you know, it's funny. We, we kind of like, you talked about murders that took place a long time ago. But, Matty, uh, it seems to me that if somebody was killed in 1990 or 1995 and you come up with evidence to convict that person or to try and bring the killer of that person to justice, I think it's something that the government, law enforcement, should do. Uh, it is much more difficult, perhaps, for a defense lawyer to defend that kind of a case. But by the same token, it's also as difficult, it seems to me, to convict someone of a murder that took place 20, 25, 30 years ago. But I think that, you know, when, when you're coming, you're dealing with life, uh, that, is the, that is the ultimate crime. Taking someone's life is the ultimate crime. And I think that's why there is no statute of limitations on murder in state courts and why the government tries whenever it can uh, to come up with a way to prosecute someone for murders uh, that took place 20, 30 years ago. Now, you've, you've written a lot about criminal defendants and organized crime cases, so-called gangsters. Uh, do you have one favorite or one that you like the least, or someone you like the most, if you like anyone? <laughs> well, that's, I, you know, the, the story that I like best and the, I'm most excited about is the one I'm working on for next week and the, the, the coming one. I, I don't really have um, any kind of favorite or gangsters or favorite uh, law enforcement officials. Uh, there have been some good ones that I've dealt with, um, some great, you know, uh, detectives. I mean, everybody knows or should know the name of Kenny McCabe, who was a, uh, a detective for the Brooklyn DA's office and then became a, uh, a federal investigator for the Southern District or the Manhattan U.S. Attorney's Office. I mean, he was, he was a great one. He was someone who uh, worked at it, and his father was a district attorney during the uh, Murder Inc. days uh, back in the 40s and 50s. Um, I mean, he's someone that, you know, I got to know along the way. And, you know, it's one of those things that I rarely got a chance to talk to him, but I did see him in court quite a few times. And I did, uh, 
you know, um, <laughs> get a lot of information from the stuff that he did. But as far as the, you know, uh, I, I don't have any favorite organized crime guys, that's for sure. I, I met a few, I've spoken to a few. Most of them uh, would not be happy to even hear me mention that I did speak to them. But, but, I, but I did run into people on occasion in, the, in Brooklyn and Manhattan, Carmine Persico, John Gotti. Um, I, I ran into them and said hello and exchanged pleasantries with them uh, when I ran into them on the streets uh, in Brooklyn and in Manhattan. You know, when, when you wrote the book, Mob Star, uh, there was a lot of grumbling in the underworld. Oh, Jerry Capisi is out to get John Gotti. He's out to get John Gotti. Listen, I know that the United States government was out to get John Gotti by, you know, any which way they could. But I never thought that, that you were, you know, had a personal vendetta against him. I mean, what, what made you decide to write the book? Mob Star, which is all about John, his early well, days. That happened because <laughs> my co-author, Gene Mustaine, happened to be uh, working for the Daily News at the same time I did back in the 1986 and 1987. And the Daily News gave him an assignment to cover the, uh, the Gotti trial. He did what's called a curtain raiser in the newspaper business, basically letting everybody know what the case was all about. An enterprising um, agent saw his name on a story, called him up and said, hey, how about you do a book about John Gotti? And Gene Mustaine, who I had never really met, um, we, even though we had worked at the same newspaper, uh, called me up and said, hey, Jerry, you seem to know a little bit about this. Maybe we should write a book about this. And that was the beginning of my career as an author. Gene and I wrote... Uh, Mob Star, then we did the Murder Machine back in 1991, 1992, and that stemmed from uh, the, the Gotti book. When, when we were writing the book about John Gotti, we came up with this great transcript of a uh, conversation where Gene Gotti was mentioning that uh, they're not a, they're not, they didn't want to do any, they didn't want to go after this Roy DeMeo crew because they had a lot of people that could do work. And we said, who is this? group of people that the John Gotti crew is afraid of. And that's what led us to Roy DeMeo and the Murder Machine, a book that we wrote in 1992. My favorite books that you wrote, and, and I, have to, I have to be very honest, I mean, I don't like books about rats, and, and, and I don't read books written by rats and, and all that stuff. Please forgive me for, for saying that, but that's the truth. That's the way I feel in my heart. But when I read your book, about Al DiArco, who's probably the most prolific government cooperator in history. I have to say it was so well done, the way the chapters were broken up, the history that this guy gave about his personal life. How did you get into that project, the project with Al DiArco and the book, Mob Boss? Well, that... that <laughs> That's something that I thought about doing uh, many years ago when uh, the first time I ran into Al Diarco in court, uh, I tried to get a hold of him and never, he never agreed to, uh, to do a book uh, with me. But at some point, uh, I managed to reach out to him again and he agreed to, uh, do, <laughs> to tell his life story, so to speak. One of the things that I made sure to do was I got somebody who could help me write the book Tom Robbins did a great job with me, I think, of putting the book together. And we had a lot of discussions with Al. And the key thing we told Al was, we're going to write the book. This is not going to be Al DiArco's book. This is going to be our book. You tell us anything and everything that we ask you. Will you answer every question we ask you? And don't tell us what we can write or uh, can't write. And we'll go along with and, and do this book. He was interested in telling his story. And to be honest, I think uh, he was probably, no question, the most, um, like you said, prolific, but the best um, cooperating witness, the way the government says, rat, the way you would call him, uh, to uh, testify in, in federal court. He seemed to have an uncanny memory for detail. Uh, defense lawyers, claimed that he made it up, but he was never really uh, caught on any lies that I could uh, think of. So um, I think that he did tell an interesting story and he did have an interesting life. And uh, uh, he managed to, uh, uh, after, after cooperating, not get arrested 
on any silly crimes like many, many cooperating witnesses these days do, as you well know. You know, Jerry, are, are you contemplating doing any more books um, in the near future? Um, I don't think so, Matty. Um, maybe, maybe we could tell your life story. <laughs> I don't think so. It's got to the point that the column keeps me busy. It's uh, it's become a full time uh, gig for me writing the column. And like you said, I do three three items a week. To, you know, two thousand twenty five hundred words each week, and it's right enough. Right now, it's enough uh, to keep me busy uh, all week. I don't think there's any more books coming out in uh, in my day anyway. <laughs> you know, it's interesting about the cooperators. I was just thinking today that it, it might be a very interesting book. And I know a lot of books have been done, but never a comprehensive, cataloged book about where have all these rats gone, okay? Now, I don't expect anyone to be writing a book and saying, oh, here's the address where so-and-so lives. But it's interesting. It's so interesting. If it could be limited just to the, the government cooperators who are supposed to live a life of a law-abiding life after their cooperation, and how many of them, how many of them go right back into heinous criminal activity over and over with the government's protection? Oh, there's no question about it. It's the only life they know, for the most part, it's the only life they've ever known, and eventually when the money runs out that the government gives them and it's they realize that it's not easy to get a full-time job and work honestly a lot of them go back to uh, stealing robbing and doing whatever it was that they did in the past there's no question about it um it's it's it is uh, something that um, you know uh, and to be honest the government does seem to look the other way uh often when uh, you know some of the cooperating witnesses uh, get caught with the hand in the till or doing something illegal, um, you know, e eventually most of them do. Uh, when they when they commit some crimes that are bad enough, they they end up going back and getting prosecuted uh, as they should. Um, there is a little bit of a double standard though when it comes to prosecuting cooperating witnesses after they've done their time and gotten the uh, sweetheart deal uh, that they've been given for the cooperation deals. That's one of the things, like I mentioned earlier, that Al Diarco never got back into. He, you know, once he got his deal, he, 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 he did it as well as could be done and did not get back into uh, organized crime. Although when we spoke to him, Tom and I, Tom Robbins and I spoke to him quite a few times. And he said many times that he wished he could and did go back to what he had been, you know, done and doing all his life because he loved it. But he, you know, the reason why he flipped, according to him, was because organized crime the way he knew it, the mob, the Cosa Nostra, kind of like lost its way, according to him. He felt his leaders were uh, violating all the rules, were killing people for no reason, just because they wanted to get ahead, make money for themselves. And that's why he decided to flip. So uh, it's kind of, you know, I think that you, you, you're, t I, I'm really happy that you thought so well of the Al Diarco book because uh, you're a pretty good uh, student of this, uh, of this, of the game, so to speak, and of the life, so to speak. And I'm, uh, I'm really pleased for you to hear you say that. You know, the, the book was just well done. And the way the chapters were, were configured, it just was, it flowed so easily. And, and the funny thing is, you know, he doesn't talk about, being a cooperator, a rat, until the very end. So we get kind of a, a good insight into his life as, as a young man, kind of growing up all over the place. He was out in Canarsie. He was, he was in Little Italy. Uh, he, he frequented many different neighborhoods and met so many different people. He spent a little time in jail. So, it, you know, the book was entertaining. You know, I don't know if you could believe his version of the facts uh, in terms of uh, why he flipped. Uh, I think he just kind of, you know, blew his cork. But uh, many defense lawyers that I have talked to over the years who cross-examined him certainly had a legitimate basis to doubt to doubt his credibility. But let me ask you this is before we close out. Uh, I know you, you told me about Kenny McCabe probably being your favorite cop. I mean... Through the years, watching so many criminal defense lawyers 
Uh, who are some of your favorites in terms of their professional ability? Well, uh, dealing with organized crime cases specifically, uh, Jimmy LaRosa, I thought was, you know, was uh, pounds the best. Uh, he passed away a, a years ago. I, I tried to do a nice tribute to him. Uh, Jerry Shargell was also a great, you know, did a great job uh, representing uh, gangsters. Uh, uh, he was the guy who was responsible, in my view, for um, winning the acquittal of uh, John Gotti uh, in state court back in 19, was it 1990? Um, he, he, he was a master. And you know, Ben Braffin does a good, did a good job too. The reason why Jimmy LaRosa and Jerry Shargell, I think, was so successful is they worked at it. They read every piece of paper that the government gave them, like you do, Maddie. When you, you know, when you're representing somebody, you have to get as much information as you can about the cooperating witnesses and the government's evidence to try and undercut it. And I think uh, Jerry Shargell, Jimmy Lewis, and Ben Rankin, to a degree, uh, they do that kind of, uh, you know, hard work uh, that they um, that ne is needed to successfully represent uh, an organized crime guy. Jerry, before we wrap it up, uh, where can people get those books? Mob Boss, Mob Star, Murder Machine. Well, uh, Amazon. You can get them at your favorite uh, bookseller, wherever it might be. Online, Amazon.com. Uh, Barnes & Noble has them. Uh, you know, if, if you're excited about them, you can check my column, ganglionnews.com. Uh, the books uh, that are, uh, I have written and co-authored, you can read about without subscribing to Gangland News. Gangland News is a paid subscription website. To read the weekly column, uh, you have to subscribe because you're five bucks a month. But to read about the books, you can just click on the ganglandnews.com and click on the link that says uh, books and you can check out to see what books I've done and co-authored and uh, uh, where you can get them. They're available and, wherever books are sold. And how easy is it to subscribe to ganglandnews.com. Uh, takes you less than five minutes. Um, and the key thing is you got to be willing to pay $5 a month for um, to read it. But there are no zero pop-up ads. When you subscribe to most <laughs> news organizations these days, it takes you 20 minutes, uh, half, of, half of the reading time to get through the pop-up ads. There are zero. None. We don't have any ads on ganglandnews.com. What you see is, you know, and what you get is what I write about and what is up there to read. Certainly, certainly worth five bucks a month. Chair, we're out of time, and I've got to bid you adieu for now, and I'm hoping to get you back here someday soon. Uh, we're going to try to uh, change the podcast up a little bit and be more interactive with, with guests. So thank you for coming on. It's always a pleasure and an honor to speak to you. Matty, it was a pleasure for me to chat with you on, <laughs> on your podcast. Good luck with it, and uh, we'll speak to you soon. I'll see you in the courthouse one of these days. Okay. So I think that's about it for today, and that is The View from Mulberry Street.